Last week, we read about Jesus absolutely shutting the mouths of religious Pharisees as he healed a man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. According to the religious leaders, this was Jesus's, this was Jesus breaking God's law. And the last thing we read last week was that the beginnings of a plot to murder Jesus was taking shape. And so far in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen Jesus cast out demons, setting the spiritually captive free. We've seen him heal individuals such as Peter's mother-in-law, the paralytic, the leper, and the man with the shriveled hand. But we've also seen Jesus move to compassion and heal many people. The Gospel of Mark doesn't give us numbers, but paints a picture that these ministry events would bleed late into the evening for Jesus. And word begins to spread all over about a man from Nazareth who has authoritative teaching and a healing touch. And people perhaps wonder, could he be the Messiah? Or is he simply a prophet, a teacher, a rabbi, or a miracle worker? Or is there more to Jesus? So as we proceed through the Gospel of Mark, we're going to, see, we're going to continue to see how word spreads about Jesus and everyone wants a slice of his miraculous touch. Today we're going to read and work our way through verses 7 through 12 of chapter 3 of Mark. So follow along in your Bibles or your following King Jesus journals. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a large crowd followed from Galilee, and a large crowd followed from Judea, and Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. And since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. You know, verse 7 tells us that Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea. And I want you to notice that Jesus spent intentional time and specific time with his disciples. The masses would follow him, but as a part of Jesus' strategy to infiltrate the globe with the gospel, his plan involved investing in and doing life with a few. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this here because I know that we'll have other opportunities to discuss this. But nevertheless, I just want to point out how significant it was for Jesus to spend time with a select few. And guys, I can't emphasize this enough. Relationships are important. And good, godly, life-giving relationships are the absolute best and a necessary part of not only our walk with Christ, but just in life in general. Now, the book of Proverbs tells us this, The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. So let me ask you a question. According to this proverb, are you wise or are you a fool? I'll let you answer that question. But it should be pretty obvious if you examine who you spend time with, who are you listening to, and what time are you giving to intentional, life-giving, gospel-saturated, God-centered relationships. Now here, Jesus is trying to spend some time with his friends, but Mark shares with us that a crowd is following him. In fact, verse 7 and 8 tells us this, And a large crowd followed from Galilee, and a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. Mark doesn't share exactly how many people are in this large crowd. However, we get a good idea in the verses that follow that it's a lot. And they're essentially like, almost like forming a mob around Jesus. But what I want you to notice in this text is where everyone is coming from. Notice all the varying towns and cities people are coming from to pursue Jesus. They're not just coming from the immediate vicinity at this moment. News about Jesus is spreading far and wide, and everyone wants to draw close to Him. What's interesting about these different places is that these crowds would involve both Gentile and Jewish people, meaning people are coming from all different backgrounds and all different faiths, all in pursuit of Jesus. Now, why they're looking for Jesus, we'll get to in a minute. But what I think we can glean from this is this. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. And that is that good news is for everyone. What a beautiful reminder for us this morning that Jesus is for all people, that salvation is available to both Jew and Gentile through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the most exclusive message while simultaneously being an incredibly inclusive message. Its exclusivity is found in the fact that there is but one mediator between God and man. It's through the God-man Jesus Christ. 
There is no other way in which man is saved but by the glorious atoning work of Jesus. But it is incredibly inclusive in that anyone and everyone who is willing to put their faith in Jesus is able to access God's grace through him. This is amazing news because it means that there is an incredible amount of hope for our neighbors and our family members and our friends. That that no one is out of reach of God's love and His saving grace. Jesus did not come to one particular people of one particular region. God's redemptive plan did not begin and end with one people group. But instead it was a plan set into motion by which it would be a blessing to all peoples. And this is why Jesus would later tell his disciples to make disciples of all nations. In other words, every nation, every tongue, every people group has access to salvation through Jesus. And this is incredible news for us because in case you forgot, we live in a world where there are so many people that are lost and living their lives without hope because they do not know Jesus. And in case you forgot, we live in a city where so many of our neighbors have not surrendered to Jesus. But yet we have the most incredible, most loving, most amazingly good news available to mankind. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin so that we can be reconciled to God the Father. And in a world surrounded with so much bad news and death and politics and discouragement and violence, we have the greatest news known to man. And that good news is for everyone. So guys, don't keep it a secret Don't be ashamed of this good news. Don't be shy or afraid because the world that we live in is incredibly proud and vocal about its sin and darkness. Why do we need to be silent about this amazing good news? Now verse 8 and 9 goes on to say, The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Mark gives us a clue as to how large of a mob is forming. It appears it is such a daunting crowd that Jesus is essentially fearful of being crushed. It seems like things have now gotten out of hand and the crowd is uncontrollable. The author shares that this crowd that is coming from all these different places, made up of people from different cultures, heard about the miracle working power of Jesus. They had heard about how the kingdom of heaven had kissed the earth and people were receiving miracles. This is something no one had ever seen or experienced before. And so Jesus tells his disciples to get a small boat to sail out towards the sea. Why a small boat? So that no one else could fit lest they follow him right out into the middle of the lake. And you know, in our, if our, in our Western culture, so often we deem a big crowd like, like this a success. Wouldn't you think that having such a large crowd following you around is evidence that you have a successful ministry? That you have a platform and an audience? But here's the truth. If you're taking down down notes, you can write this down. Number two, bigger does not always equal better. You know, why is the crowd looking for Jesus? It was because they heard about everything he was doing. Not necessarily because they heard of everything he was teaching. It wasn't in pursuit of God or to access the Messiah. It was to receive something. But here's the thing. There's a lot of people doing it. There's a large crowd all wanting the same thing. And so since there's a lot of people, doesn't that mean that it's a good thing? Not necessarily. You know, so often we equate something that is large as successful, especially when it comes to ministry. But you can gather a crowd of people and not necessarily be healthy or gather them for the right reasons. This is with anything in life. Just because there are a lot of people agreeing with a particular idea does not make that idea right. The consensus of many people does not necessarily equate with correct thinking. There can be a lot of people heading in the same direction, and they can all be heading in the wrong direction. And here, there are many people, in fact, a large crowd of people, attempting to get to Jesus, and they nearly crush Him, but their intentions are off. In fact, look at what verse 10 says. Since He had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward Him, to touch him. And so now we see as clear as day why people are pursuing Jesus. You see, he had healed many. Many people received this healing touch. Many people had their diseases removed from their bodies through his healing touch. And more people want to experience that. 
Of course, you can imagine in an era where science had not advanced to the degree that it has today, and there's a lot of desperate people in, in pursuit of Jesus. People with diseases and deformities and chronic pain and infections and, 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 and more, all in pursuit of alleviation from those things. But as we mentioned previously, this is not the main purpose behind why Jesus had left his throne in heaven. His purpose was actually something greater than bringing relief to people's physical pain. And while much of his ministry certainly showed compassion to those who were suffering through a reverse of the sin curses, God walked you know, among men and brought about restoration. It was not his main mission. And so this leads us to ask this question. Again, if you're taking notes, you can write this down on the number three. Are you following Jesus for the right reasons? You see, the crowd pushed in because people wanted to get something from Jesus instead of approaching him for who he is. They were attempting to simply get relief from what ailed them, but they weren't interested in receiving what he actually came to bring. And I'd pose this question to us today. Why are you following Jesus? What is the motive behind your pursuit? Is it so that you can receive something from Him? Do you want Him to get you out of whatever bind you put yourself in? Do you want Him to take away whatever is hurting your heart? Do you want Him so that He can right your wrongs, eliminate your dead, and heal all your hurts? So many times we pursue God when we've hit rock bottom, and we turn to Him to try and and, and receive a get-out-of-jail-free card. And Unfortunately, this is also why so many people leave Him once they get what they're looking for. We oftentimes want to treat God more like a genie than the almighty, all-powerful God that is worthy of your surrender and your worship. It might just be because you haven't truly gotten a glimpse at His glory. Jesus' redemptive mission was not simply a healing crusade. He's God in flesh. He's God's love made tangible, walking among men to ultimately surrender Himself as a sacrifice in order to redeem whom He loves back to Himself. And I pray that we might get a proper glance at Jesus and draw near to Him for who He is and what He's done, not just for what He could do. And if you came here today with the mentality of, what can Jesus do for me? I pray the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to the glory and the majesty of Jesus and that you would change your mind. In fact, check this out. Check out this interesting detail, verses 11 and 12, leave with us as we round out this passage. It says this, Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. I want you guys to imagine all the crowds pressing in. They're reaching out their hands, attempting to touch Jesus so they can receive healing. And then in the middle of all that, some were demonized and would scream out these words, You are the Son of God. People would be standing, running, walking toward Jesus, but those who were oppressed by demons would fall flat on their faces before Jesus and make this declaration, You are the Son of God. What is this a picture of? When you you see someone flat on their face, it's a sign of surrender. It's a sign of worship. You see the large crowds pressing in on Jesus don't truly know who He is, but do you know who does? The demons do. And at the presence of Jesus, these unclean spirits, as the gospel describes them, are unable to stand before Him. They're forced to fall in submission to the King. So this leads us to ask one final question of ourselves. Do you know the King? Have you fully gotten a glimpse at the glory of King Jesus? Do you know who He is? If you do, then number four in your notes, then give the King His proper worship. Submit and surrender to King Jesus, not simply for what He can do for you, but simply because He is worthy of all your worship and your honor and glory. Don't come to church because you think it's some favor you're doing for God. Come to fall flat on your face in submission and surrender to Jesus. Some of you might have come here because you have a serious need. And listen, I don't want to take away from whatever need you might have because it's valid. You, you, you have pain, you have emotional hurt, you have trauma, you have difficulty and challenges. All of that is true. And you know what? If that pain has brought you to this place, praise God for that. God has a way of getting the glory even from the most tragic and difficult of circumstances in our lives. But instead of receiving what you think you need, 
Allow me to point you to what you actually need. Allow me to point you to Jesus. And in pointing you to Jesus, let me call you to fall flat on your face in submission and surrender to the King. Not for what He can do for you, but because He is worthy. The reason the unclean spirits fall before Jesus is because He is God in flesh. He's God's solution to man's sin problem. This is the problem we all have and face, that before a holy and righteous God we stand sinful and with an overwhelming debt we will never be able to pay down. But instead of dealing us the consequences that we deserve for our rebellion, instead God enters our brokenness and sin. He stands in the gap and walks among men as the perfect sinless Lamb of God. And though He was with no sin of His own, He was led to a cross to pay a criminal's debt. He was mocked and rejected. He was beaten and marred beyond recognition. His hands and feet were stretched out and nails were driven through them until eventually he breathed his last breath and he died. They would remove his lifeless body from the cross and place him in a tomb. And there he would lie for three days until Sunday morning, the king would rise yet again. He would conquer Satan, sin, and death. And because Jesus conquered death, our sin that is paid, we no longer are in debt because of our sin, because the king's sacrifice covers a multitude of our sins. And for all who look to Jesus and put their faith in His finished work, and for all who submit and surrender to King Jesus, for all who see Him in all His glory and splendor and receive God's gift of grace by faith, you can be saved. You have forgiveness of sin. You have new life. You have eternity with the Father. You are a child of God. And this should lead us to proper worship of the King. If you haven't surrendered to King Jesus, here's an invitation to do so. Don't wait for a miracle. Don't delay, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Give your life to Him today. Jesus, we, we give you all the worship and all the glory and all the honor, not simply because of what you can do for us, but because of who you are, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Savior of our souls. Lord, forgive us if we ever followed you for the wrong reasons. If there's anyone today under the sound of my voice that has been mistaken or led astray, convict their hearts and draw them back to you. Lord, help us to be faithful to your word. No matter what the masses say, may we be obedient to your word. And Jesus, we know that the gospel is good news for everyone. So please do not delay in saving our friends and our family and our neighbors, oh God. Help us be good news people and that we might point people to your saving grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.